Seven years into the war in Syria, with all the state and non-state actors who have become part of that story, it's easy to forget how it all began. With an uprising, a people's rebellion against an authoritarian government, a fight for democracy and a free media. Ra'ed Fares was one of the figureheads of that movement until he was shot dead last week alongside his cameraman, probably by fighters linked to al-Qaeda. Fares used various forms of media, especially radio, to push a revolutionary agenda from the town of Kafranbel in the rebel-held province of Idlib. Five years ago, he started organizing protests there and came up with innovative ways to call out the hypocrisy of the West. He riffed on news coverage he disapproved of. He focused on the suffering of ordinary Syrians. With Assad and his backers still largely in control, some see the killing of Fares as symbolic, the extinguishing of any remaining hope that the values of the Arab Spring can live on in Syria. Our starting point this week is the town where Ra'ed Fares lived and died, the one he put on the map, Kafranbel. <laughs> Raid was a one-man revolution. He did it all, but he specialized in the media. He excelled there. He was a pioneer. He may not have been a professional journalist, but he did what you could call alternative media. He is impossible to replace. Raid Fahed's story reflects the path of the Sin uprising. Firstly, this massive protest movement challenging an authoritarian, despotic uh, Assad regime. And Raed Faris uh, represented the dynamic of this protest movement. The first wave of protest leaders uh, were either dead, they disappeared in, in jail somewhere, or they had fled the country to seek safety in exile. But Raed Faris was one of the few who remained in his country and who continued his work from inside Syria and he paid with his life for that activism. In most places, straddling the line between journalism and activism is problematic. Objectivity can suffer. Audiences don't really know what they're getting. And calling the late Ra'ed Fares a journalist would be inaccurate. There was too much activism in the work he did. However, that's an ethical issue for outsiders to ponder. Inside Syria, more than seven years into this war, such a debate would feel like a luxury, an indulgence. One of the most important aspects of media work and the Syrian revolution is this blurring of boundaries between journalism, activism, art making and human rights work. When you are in a very dark, difficult situation where your survival cannot be taken for granted, you're not as concerned with a sort of a strictly narrowly defined journalism uh, focused on impartiality, on, on basic facts, as finding out how to survive and helping other people get information that helps them survive. And Ra'ed, in that sense, was what I called um, a creative insurgent, right? He was an exemplary creative insurgent. Well, Ra'ed Ferris didn't hide the fact uh, that he was an activist. He didn't hide his views or his political slant. On the contrary, uh, he and his colleagues shared their messages in bright colors, on white fabric banners, and in biting cartoons and video skits. So, uh, you know, that was very clear where he was coming from. And they also spared no one. Their uh, messages were directed against the Assad regime. They were also directed against the Syrian political opposition exile, the foreign backers of both the rebels and uh, the Assad government, as well as the Islamists who came to have increasing power in Kaframbil and other parts of Idlib where Ra'id was based. Ra'ed Fares started to make his mark in the Syrian media space in 2013, two years after the war broke out. At the time, Syrians in search of news were relying on TV channels coming out of Damascus, controlled by the Assad government, and pan-Arab news networks, some of which had their own dogs in the fight. Fares's contribution to a media landscape that was mostly high-tech, the TV news channels beaming in via satellite, the bloggers spreading information and misinformation over the web was tactically low-tech. The channel he helped create was called Radio Fresh. Riot Fires and his team established Radio Fresh in 2013. This was a way to promote 
uh, different democratic ideals, women's role in society, challenging conservative traditional ideas as well. And it was very important to have an independent media to show uh, the message of the people, what they were struggling for against uh, the regime, but also from the Western or uh, Gulf uh, medias that had their own agenda. So it was very important to, sh to have an independent uh, media instrument from the ground. Radio is very easy to transmit and very easy to listen to. Radio also can give you minute by minute uh, very specific micro-local information that in some cases can be life-saving. So for example, you can uh, learn that uh, Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria has set up a checkpoint and they're looking for activists that they're kidnapping uh, at that crossing. And so activists know not to drive or not to walk that way at that moment. And that's crucially important. So radio is crucial here, and the decision to use radio, I think, was brilliant. Ra'ed Fares also knew his audiences. His messages to the outside world, pleas for help, were in English, splashed on banners, telegenic, and designed for export via someone else's camera. Radio Fresh broadcasts in Arabic to local listeners. No one has claimed responsibility for Ferez's murder, but Hayat et Tahrir al-Sham, a fundamentalist group in control of Kafran Bell, a former affiliate of Al-Qaeda, is among the suspects. Extremist groups had attacked the station before. They opposed its output and would have disapproved of the way Radio Fresh was funded. The station was launched with the help of U.S. State Department dollars, and the U.S. continued to bankroll it until the Trump administration halted the funding earlier this year. Accepting uh, foreign support uh, in the form of money, of equipment, of technical expertise is an extremely difficult question. And here's the logic. A small uh, group of people trying to survive extremely violent conflict. On the other side, we have a well-equipped regime that's using planes and barrel bombs and even chemical weapons in some cases. It's supported by, by Russia and Iran. What can I do if I'm desperate? It becomes very difficult not to accept any aid. Everybody in Syria was backed by somebody, but that didn't necessarily mean that they bought them, that those patrons had bought them ideologically. And Ra'ad Ferris before the U.S. State Department funding was the same as Ra'ad Ferris after the U.S. State Department funding. But the U.S. funding etched, if you like, the bullseye that was already in Ra'ad Ferris's back, and it made it easier for some of his critics to uh, claim that he was a U.S. stooge or doing the U.S.'s bidding. Before the war began, Ra'ed Fares wasn't even a journalist, nor was he an activist. He worked in real estate while studying to be a doctor. He brought to journalism the zeal of a convert, and his commitment did not wane. Unlike so many Syrian activists who became targets, he did not leave the country to continue his work in exile, although no one would have blamed him if he had. He stayed, knowing that decision could cost him his life. His voice has been silenced, but the station he helped create remains on the air, reporting the news to the people of Kafranda. Ra'id Khan Ra'id Faris was an ideal. For seven or eight years, Ra'id worked to establish a moral and principled foundation for the revolution and to promote freedom of thought and expression. He is impossible to replace. We will continue his work and carry forward his message, but Free Syria has lost one of her greatest sons, Ra'id Faris.